Put on the speaker. Okay. The seats here have a hundred dollar bill. And it, it looks like you're the only one and, and this is his wife, so she isn't gonna get it. And you know, someplace over here, if he's the closest to it, but close doesn't count. It's too bad. Uh, our guest speaker tonight told me he needs forty-eight seconds of time for every year he's been in business. And he's been in business 93 years. So he's going to be talking till about 9.30 or 10 tonight. So, you know, if you have to go to the bathroom or anything, you can come and go or anything like that. He'll be speaking for about an hour. Uh, we'll be through about 7. But I want a chance to introduce him first. Uh, entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes and everything else. We tend to have a picture of an entrepreneur as a Bill Gates, or this or that, or somebody that invents the rocket ship to the moon. There are 24 million entrepreneurial businesses in America. So there are 24 million different kinds of entrepreneurs. And we don't think, he does mostly business to business type things. These aren't things you hear about. There are wonderful careers and opportunities in all sorts of types of businesses. Tune in on, on what fun he had. The other thing I want you to walk away from here with is the understanding that life takes you places you never thought you'd go. You all have majors. And, and you know, you're, 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 you're majoring in, 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 in playing the bass fiddle in a rock band. He was a history major. He's an entrepreneur. He's a business person. What counts is the education you get, how much you learn, and how you learn to use the knowledge they give you. But what happens that's more important to me, and I think you're going to like this man. I think you're going to learn a lot from this man. I've had people calling me from New York telling me how terrific he is. There's a fellow who was supposed to be here tonight and couldn't come because he was the chairman of the Dean for President Committee, and he had to go back when Dean resigned yet last night. He's out of work today. Yeah, he's, he's unemployed today, the guy is. You know, so. We're going to take a collection up at the door here. But, uh, he was telling me this is the grandest man there is in business. And I think you'll find that out tonight. What counts for me is that you'll all be successful in whatever you end up doing in life. More important than that to me is what you do with your success. And some of you guys that have been my students know I'll harp on this all day long, all week long, all month long what you do with what you achieve in success, in monetary success, in the power that comes with succeeding, the ability to cause things to happen when you become important in a community, when you become important in an industry, when you become important in a field, gives you some power. <coughs> what you do with that power and that financial success is what counts the most to me. And there's a guy I recently heard, and I told some of you guys about this just recently, <laughs> There's a football player for the Miami Dolphins that started his own little foundation where he helps kids. And I saw him interviewed on TV, and he made a statement that I've fallen in love with. It's become my passionate statement now. They said, why are you doing this? Why are you helping these young kids? Now, there's a guy that came out of the ghetto. He said, I feel I've got to help the next generation. And he said, they're trying to scale the wall. They're trying to get out of the ghetto. They're trying to make it in life. And he said, I think I'm terribly successful. I get paid millions. He says, it's my job to throw the rope over the wall for the next guy. And so he said, that's what I do in life. I like that picture. Think about that in your lives. When you get there, when you succeed, you've got to be throwing that rope over the wall for the next ones. This gentleman throws the rope over the wall very, very well. This gentleman does wonderful things. Just a couple little things. <coughs> Here at LMU, first of all, he's a regent in the university. He's sitting here making sure this joint stays good for you guys. So you have a marvelous place. Other things he does, he provides scholarships here for students. I'd like you to meet one of the Dempsey scholars. Would you stand up and wave at the crowd here? <laughs> Anna, he, he specializes, his, his niche for helping students is students who come from out of state and need special help. To, to be here and everything like that. So this is neat stuff. He's throwing you a rope, right? Yeah, Have you yeah. caught it yet? Is he, is he tugging on it? Is he making sure you're coming out? We haven't seen the grapes. We don't know. Oh, 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 okay. I'm not too worried about that. Anyway. Okay. No, 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 no. no. She'll be putting pressure on me for higher grades now. She's going to come to me now and say, if you don't give me an A, I won't get my scholarship again. 
You will, but you won't get an A necessarily unless you earn it, right? You know that. I'd also like to introduce you to Mrs. MC. And there is always a team of husband and wife that cause success in the world. And understand that all through your life. Everything that successful people do, it's always a team. So we have a marvelous team here, okay? I'll give you Miles Dempsey, a wonderful man who's going to tell you a little bit about his life. And just tune in and picture yourself. Picture what you're going to be like when you're up here. But first, before I give him to you, I'm going to give him something. Good. We have. <laughs> not money. Oh. We have the Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series, and that's what Mr. Dempsey is doing tonight. If we're going to call it the Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur, we must recognize who the Distinguished Entrepreneur is. So we are giving tonight, Mr. Dempsey, the Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur Award. And it's a gorgeous little award. Uh, it's even got his picture there. And if I can read it very quickly, it says, The Conrad Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur Award, celebrating entrepreneurial excellence, exceptional achievement, powerful leadership, and social impact. Uh, going on further down, Miles Dempsey graduated from LMU with a history major in 1958. 57. Well, I lied. I lied. <laughs> they didn't give you the degree until a year later. Oh, okay. You got an incomplete. Okay. Right? <laughs> you think I'm going to change that? No. Oh. Uh, in 1977, he founded Dempsey Enterprises on a shoestring. It has grown into five separate businesses in the industrial supply and business to business sectors. He's a superb and powerful entrepreneur who's built a real success story. The ultimate measure of the entrepreneur is what they do for society with their success and power. This man is deeply dedicated to helping the next generation to achieve their destiny and have a powerful impact on the world. His dedication to giving back to society provides a positive image and role model of what a real entrepreneur is all about. We Thank proudly you. give you this, sir. Thank you so much, Bob. Jennifer's in campus ministry here, and I had nothing to do with being hired. I didn't even know it. 
<laughs> Next to her is her husband, Edward Torrey. John Bosco High School. Is that right? And then I have my great friend and entrepreneur himself, Jerry Mook, who's a Loyola <laughs> graduate. And an entrepreneur who has great staying power. And next to him is one of my girlfriends, Sister Peck. <laughs> this is a this is a conversation, discussion, so just Jump in any time you want. I was interested in the award because it mentioned that I started the business on a shoestring. It wasn't a shoestring. I didn't have any money. So uh, when I started the business, you can do anything. I'm a history major. Uh, I never took a business course in my life. And one thing that happened, I mean, the, the, your stories are magnificent throughout. Uh, your lives. And my story really started here when I didn't have a mentor. My father had died and I came out here only because my mother wanted to come out and be with her daughter who had married a guy in the Second World War from Pasadena. So we got out here and I was like out of it. My father just happened to die. And one professor took me under his wing. His name was Anthony J. Turhallow. Dr. Turhal. And Dr. Turhal, I just saw, by the way, that uh, in the, is it the new library where his family has donated uh, you know, like $25,000 for a wing or something? Does anyone know about this? Yes. yes. Well, I, I want to put some money into that too because he got me a scholarship. Uh, I don't know, he just took a liking to me and pushed me. and He got me a scholarship to Boston College for graduate work. Guess what? I walked in and registered, and this woman registered me. <laughs> it, was it was unbelievable. So we we got married at the end of our uh, scholarship at uh, Boston College, and went on. We went on and and taught for. I taught for one year. Remember, I had no no business at all. I didn't know a debit from a credit. <laughs> Nothing. Zero. So I think the only reason I was a history major is because that meant you didn't know what you were going to do. But Dr. Turhall thought I was going to teach, so I did. So we went up to Bangor, Maine. It was rough up there. <laughs> and we taught, we taught at a Catholic high school. And I taught on the boys' side, she taught on the ladies' side. And she part-time was a uh, librarian at the Bangor Public Library. So she said to me at the end of the, the year, she said, you know, you really want to teach? I said, I don't know, I think I do. What else am I going to do? She said, well, maybe you should go into business. Well, I said, I'm going to go into business because I don't have any business background, nothing. So she looked up in the Bangor Public Library of companies that were interested in hiring liberal arts graduates and training them their own way. And one of them was household finance. Now, up in Bangor, Maine, they said, well, get on a bus and come down to Boston. So I called them, and they said, why not to Boston? So I had two or three interviews there, and I, I sort of knew that this is what I needed, because they were describing a program to me in which you'd be attached to the chairman's office in Chicago. So, lo and behold, they sent me out to Chicago, and this was a two-day interview. This was unbelievable. And... I went through all the, you know, all the senior VPs, all the vice chairmen, and I told this to some of the people. But I get up, they say, okay, now we want you to meet the chairman of the board of household finance. And I said, well, so far I've done all right. And I walked into his office and he had my resume. And he's looking at me, I'm up in the 50th floor of the Prudential Plaza building, the biggest building I've ever seen. Walk in, he says, uh, Mr. Dempsey, he said, yes, Mr. McDonald, I'm Mr. Dempsey. He paused, he said, and I'm from Massachusetts, Brockton, Massachusetts. He said, did you leave Brockton for the same reason I did? <laughs> <laughs> I figured, well, 
this interview is going to go well. So, <laughs> so this is unbelievable. So, he was in, he went from Brockton, you know, which is a great little town. He went to MIT. Anyway, I, I started there. After that, I was attached for two years to the chairman's office. Not, I'm trying to tell you how I got into business. By the time I left there, I could do anything. Talk about debits, credits, accounting, bookkeeping, cashiering, you name it, I could do it. And I could also sell and I could collect. So then, that was the beginning. And I say this because in 1977, when they described that I started the business on a shoestring, <coughs> I, I was thinking to myself, how did you ever get all? How did you get the money to do this? What it was is I worked for Household, then I went and worked for Union Carbide for almost 15 years. But I was preparing. I knew business from every end at the end of this almost 20 years. So what I had done is I not only knew business, but I had made all these relations. You know? I mean, you never know, but. I met a lot of great people. In a Union Carbide especially, I was, you know, East Coast, West Coast, back in the East Coast, seven years international, and in the last four years, I went over to a division, and I knew business. This was, I, I knew it inside now. But working for a big company, you had no money. I had five kids now. We had five children. And we had a very secure, uh, you know, business career. We had a wonderful life. But another event took place. I was with the Lindy Division of Union Carbide, and my job was to acquire companies. So I did a lot of acquisitions. And in 1976, the Federal Trade Commission came in and said, you bad boy, you're buying up too many companies. You can't do it anymore. So we signed a consent decree, Union Carbide. And what happened is, they said, you have to get out of the business by 1977. So, I could, do, I could finish up the two, bi two businesses that I was working on. One in northern New Jersey, which Union Carbide wanted, and one in White Plains, New York. And the White Plains one, no one wanted. It was bad, and it had every, everything going against it. It had a climbing business, it had uh, you know, all sorts of uh, bills they couldn't pay. So, uh, I said to the union company again, what do you want me to do? They said, well, give it to someone who's going to retire. Give them a present. So, so what I would do, I'd go to all these people who are going to retire and say, listen, you know, we're going to give you a gift. We'll give you a business. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it's great. It's, it's great. You're going to give me a business, but do we have to work? I said, yeah, you're going to have to work hard. You don't know why. <laughs> so, I had a plan, and that's number one. You've got to have a plan. My plan was to go to Union Carbide and say, look, I'll take that business. But I had to go to the right people. So, in my career with Union Carbide, I met a lot of people. I knew everyone. And they knew me because of the you know, responsibility I had. So, I went to the president of Lindy and I said, you know, I, I think I've got a buyer for the business. So, who is it? So it's me. <laughs> he almost laughed. He said, do you have any money? I said, no. He says, he says well, where are you going to get the money? I said, well, I, I thought you'd loan me the money to buy all the shareholders. So this is, this is incredible. So he said, said to me, how much do you need? I said, well, the down payment will be 50000 He said, well, where are you going to get the rest of it? I said, well, I'll convince the shareholders to take a note for the rest of it. He says, well, they owe us a quarter of a million also. And I said, you know, I said, well, I'll pay that up, but you get a get it off demand basis. I want it on a 10-year interest-bearing note. This is how the deal went down. They loaned me 50000 The shareholders took a 13-year note. The business wasn't bankable. So the second presentation he knew Carbide was, when they said, oh, how are you going to pay your bills? You know, it's not bankable. I said, well, I thought that I'd sell the building back to you. <laughs> I said, geez, we don't want a building. <laughs> I said, well, you've got to take it. 
<laughs> and I'll take you a lease and then I'll buy it back and it'll give you an option. This is how the deal went down. And then I said, oh, by the way, I don't have any salespeople who are worth anything. They said, what do you want? I said, well, you got to tell them, the lending guys have to come up and help me for six months. They have to go out and sell. And they did it. It was unbelievable. Talk about leverage. The Union Carbide people used to say, listen, this is the most classic of all Harvard Business School case studies. Take the business with nothing. So I liquidated the business, put it in Dempsey Enterprises in 1977, and that was it. Then we started in. So there are many things that I've learned over the years. Number one, relationships. I never could have done this. Because, well, in Union Carbide, they had to bring the treasurer in, obviously, keeping me like a book. Because many times when I was international, he'd be calling me, hey, how are we doing in Argentina? What's the story over in Egypt? You know, he'd want to know because they'd have to, on the financial statements every year, they had reports, they'd have to disclose anything that's going to, you know, not on the balance sheet. That's bad news. So they all, I mean, it was tremendous. That they all supported it. They said, Look, pay us off 10 years, interest bearing, you know, we'll give you all the support necessary. I never missed a payment to them. I discounted every gas bill. I'm in the industrial gas business, by the way, I don't know if you know that. You know, we're in the uh, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, mostly atmospherics, but a lot of, uh, you know, welding grade gases, and, you know, poisons, toxics, you name it, we sell it. And, you know, we, we have thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of cylinders. See them? You know, you know the gases are not in a free state. You have to package them. So that's our business. So I had to acquire all these assets. And the relation, here's another classic on this called relationships. I needed cylinders because we were renting every cylinder. The cylinders go for a hundred something dollars a piece. So one of my friends at Union Carbide, after I had left, so I say, by the way, I think I know someone who would be interested in helping you. I said, oh, who's that? He said, his name is John Stanger. So how's he going to help me? He said, well, get into a leasing company with you. John's big. But you know Jack Welch, the retired chairman of General Electric? You've heard of him? He gave several paragraphs of praise to John Stanger. Stanger, it turned out, was the president of General Electric Credit which is now GE Capital, and he built that business for Jack Welch. He would come into my office, you know, with this beautiful coat on in, in the winter, and I needed to borrow about a quarter of a million at that time. This was, you know, within a year, I, I'm, all, I'm about borrowing more money, you know. So, my, it was maybe uh, six foot by ten, my office. We couldn't sit three people, so we'd always give John the seat, you know, and I had this little table, and I'm saying to myself, oh my God, here he's coming in to see this. Well, I, I got the cylinder manufacturer, and I said, listen, uh, I think I'm going to buy a couple thousand cylinders, so it's a quarter of a million. So, well, why don't you come in and have lunch, or have dinner with us? So John Stanger and I, and two other guys from Union Carbine, we had dinner with the cylinder manufacturer. Well, after they find out who John Stanger was, no problem. When do you want them shipped? <laughs> so by doing this, I could get rid of the rentals. You know, I'm building all my assets. So anyway, th this, this is the story of how you never know who's going to help you. But then once they help you, you never let them down. I paid the bills meticulously. Never went beyond terms. And I told you about Union Carbide, well, both Union Carbide and Household Finance, two great companies, which tells you about a bunch of entrepreneurial work. Union Carbide no, doesn't any longer exist. They were bought out by our arch competitor, Dow Chemical. Household Finance is now part of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank because the people didn't pay attention to what they were doing. And I learned from them but you've got to pay attention to the details. <coughs> if someone's going to help you, make sure that you deliver everything that you say you're going to do. 
It's part of my business philosophy, which is make a promise, you better keep it. I don't care what happens, you keep it. No one wants to know if your truck's down. No one wants, wants to know if you know, one of your dock workers didn't show up. You've got to do it. So, the summary of that, let's fast forward 42 years. I was old going in to entrepreneurial business. But I had the preparation. I didn't have the capital, but I got it. So many other stories about how I got capital. You know, just people is, you know, knew me from my new combat days and needed to, you know, get a write off. You know, one guy I met <laughs> twice. Guy said, I said, geez, you need to put up a cylinder filling station a little small. I said, yeah, I'd like to. He said, well, how much would it cost? I said, about 180000 This was within a year. He says, man, I, I got to have some, I, I need some expenses. I can't pay all these taxes. <laughs> okay, he says, I'll give you 180000 Make sure you pay me. He said, don't worry, I'll pay you. I did. But this is how you, you know, you have to <coughs> deliver on everything you're doing. So, that's another way of saying you've got to, you know, in entrepreneurial business, of course you want to sell. You know, you need revenue, you need top line. You know, you're a consumer of the P&L, but you better watch that balance sheet. I can, to today, tell you exactly how much cash we have. I know it. Since day one, we've run complete financial statements. We have five businesses now, operating businesses, plus a plan. And I can tell you every month, complete financial statement, P&L to balance sheet, Everything reconciled. Today I'll tell you how much we get in the cash. Cash is king. It is. I never went to the bank. Because if I had to go hat in hand with them, I know they'd want something. I did it all outside the banking circle. Because they'd want, you know, some working capital covenants. By the way, Union Carbide, if they wanted uh, operating covenants, I said, no, no. If you want operating covenants, I'm not doing the deal. Because, you know, I had to do the whole thing. I had to do it myself. <clears throat> you know? So the banks, now they come and they say, oh, no, no. You know, can't you deposit some money in us? So, um, I want to be the one to tell them. You know, they're not going to tell me. I said, what can you do for me? the other way around, usually for them, you know? So, okay. Let's fast forward. A couple other things that I, 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 you know, someone said to me, what does it take to be a successful entrepreneur? You know, we're successful, I measure it because we've been around, you know? And one of the banks that does some business with us, we throw them a bone now and then because they sold me a couple of their buildings. You know, it did a wonderful deal. So they said, you know why we like you people? I said, no, you tell me, Charlie. He said, you got great staying power. We've been around. And I think that's right. You know, people who can stay in for 10, 15, 20, 25 years and, you know, just keep going is amazing. You know, we started off as the company that I bought was out of it, but you know, they had a little bit of business, welding business, welding related mostly, you know, settling, you know, argon, welding gases, stuff like that. But I saw something in that market, which is just above New York City, 15 miles north of New York City. I saw something there that the competitors were doing wrong. There was a business that was growing up in the late 70s. Specialty gas, rare gases, you know, gases that you clean up. You get rid of the contaminants. You know, research people tend to, you know, we're using them. And I, I could see that all around my business. You know, General Foods was there, no longer around, by the way. American Cyanide was using a lot, no longer around. So, anyway, I, I knew what was wrong. 
they were delivering from the plant, which was across the Hudson River, you know, maybe 30 miles or 40 miles away, but they were delivering by common carrier. And the common carrier wouldn't deliver when the research people wanted it. So I went to Union Carbide and they said, listen, you know, shouldn't I be able to do a lot of business in specialty gases? And oh yeah, you can do it. I said, well, let's load some into the my location. We took all that business. It was unbelievable. And they were asleep at the switch. Now our biggest customers, and they're huge customers, are people like Sloan Kettering, Columbia University, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, who and Miss Cornell. Any other big ones? Uh, but anyway, they're huge. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yale. Okay. Yale. You know, ATMI, a big, huge company. But we deliver. You know, they tell us. They say, look, when, when do you want it? I, I don't really care. Oh, the other thing that uh, people would tell me when I went into this business, they say, listen, you know, this is an eight to five business. Eight to five? <laughs> you sure? I said, yeah. I said, well, what about these contractors? They come in at 8. I see them out, you know, excavating land at 6 in the morning. You know, and I see them sadly roaming around. No, no. I said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're starting early and we're working late. That's number one. Uh, number two, how about let's open Saturday? Because I think a lot of these people need deliveries on Saturday and they want to come in. Oh, no, never happened. Oh, say, by the way, do we deliver? <coughs> yes, we deliver. Fine, there's going to be a delivery charge. Delivery charge? No one's going to pay a delivery charge. Well, if it's on my truck, they're going to pay a delivery charge. Oh, okay. Oh. We have a lot of revenue on delivery charge because people know that if I'm running a $60,000 truck where the driver's also getting $60,000, I'm not delivering for free. And I always look at what FedEx and UPS does. They're tremendous. You want it tomorrow? Yeah, sure, you get it tomorrow. You want it before 10? Fine. It's a different price. What do you want? You want it at uh, 2 o'clock? That's a different price. <laughs> you want it two days? It's a different price. I'll say to anyway, you, what do you want? Once a month? You don't have to pay a delivery charge every week. <laughs> every time I come, once a month. It'd be great. So, you, you know, you, you have to know what the customer does. We have a tremendous business on Saturdays. I mean, oh, there's another thing. People, when I came in, the people said to me, uh, uh, the way to go is charcoal if you're broiling. You know charcoal? I said, I don't think so. It's kind of dirty. I said, well, that's how it is. People like the taste. I said, okay, well, I'm going to start filling 20-pound barbecue tanks. We filled tens of thousands of them. And we were the first to. And we put, you know, made it very easy for someone to come in. I built a dock just for the barbecue tanks. <laughs> they just rolled in. We had direct traffic in some of the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we had, had traffic cops. Okay, you know, you can find it. But don't listen to people tell you, it's what the customer wants. The customer is the focus. It's not me. It's not I. Doesn't matter. It's number one, we. We are in this together. Every employee we have, we're in it together. I tell them about it all the time. We're in this together. Are we in it together? Yeah, we're in it together. Okay. And how do you motivate them to be in it together? You treat them right. You give them the opportunity to be wealthy. Pay for performance. We pay for performance. You want a profit sharing? We've had one since 1979 when we couldn't afford it. Profit sharing. We also have a 401k. You want to put in 10% of your pay? We'll give you 50% of that on top of it. We have a lot of wealth created. Because we're in it together. We also tell them, we tell the customer, look, don't worry about a thing. 
you're going to get nothing but the best. <clears throat> I've taken a little literary license because the company that I bought out and liquidated it to Dempsey Enterprises traced its roots back to 1935. So our registered mark is nothing but the best since 1935. That means something to a lot of people. And that's how we do it. So, you want to be entrepreneurs? I guarantee you one thing. You'll work hard, very hard, or you won't be successful. You'll put in long hours, or you won't be successful. You've got to focus on the customer. It's what the customer wants, or you won't be successful. You want to take off Saturdays and Sundays? Forget it. Stay with what you're doing. If there's a problem with a blood bank, we don't say we're coming tomorrow. We're coming in now. Don't worry, I'll start the plan though. That's what we do. It's simple. Don't get, you know, it's not all highfalutin. You know, it's, it's a very simple, hard work. Yeah. Dear customer, what do you want? Well, let me see, well, you know, see if we can get a book. Oh, yeah. You want it? We just changed out 800 cylinders on a Sunday at the Sloan Kettering Hospital, which we had we didn't have the business. But you know, we have a lot of business at Sloan, but we didn't have that particular business. On a Sunday. 800 competitive cylinders. Pick them up tomorrow. Because ours are in there today. That's what you have to do. It's all hard work. Okay. <coughs> Details. In our business, we have you know, probably 35, 40,000 cylinders in service every day. The customer doesn't want to think that you don't know how many cylinders he has, and you better be sure that those are the number that you, you delivered, less the ones he returned. <coughs> we don't want errors. Customers don't want errors. So, my son years ago came and he said, Jesus, he said, I think we ought to go on a computer system to track <coughs> these cylinders, where we are. We've got to confirm that we know everything about them. But what's it going to cost us? You know, probably a hundred plus <coughs> three years of manpower, you know, taking every serial number, 35, 40,000 cylinders, putting a barcode on them. It's unbelievable. But now there's no one can touch us. Closed loop. Someone says, hey, where was that customer? Where was that someone? How long have I had that someone? Well, we not only can tell you how long you had that someone, we can tell you the PO, we can tell you where it went, we can tell you who signed for it, we can tell you who had it before you. That's what they want. And people will pay for that. Your customers will pay for that. That knowledge that you know what you're doing. They don't want you to cut corners. Don't cut corners. Depending upon what your business is. Obviously, in our business, we can't cut corners. You know? And you better put oxygen in an oxygen cylinder. <laughs> yeah. so. Relationships, so I've talked about that. Hard work, long hours, focus. You know, you, you can forget about vacations. I don't think we've taken a vacation that, that wasn't <clears throat> tied in with an association meeting or something. And I don't know how long. Maybe now we do. <laughs> now we do. <laughs> but before we did. And so, keep your promises. You know, you know what it's all about. I mean, you, you gotta. If you want to stay in business, it's all about trusting. You know, have a lot of faith, hope. You know, that you're going to do the job better than the competitor. We, we don't want to be equal. We don't want to be good. You know, I learned in my household finance day from a senior VP. I was just a, you know, everyone say, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. This guy never said good morning. This guy would walk out of your office and go, hey, how you doing? How you doing, Dempsey? Oh, doing fine. How about you? I'm doing good. So I say to him, why do you say that all the time? How come you don't you know, do what everyone else does? You know, bonjour, you know, how are you? you know, this 
guy said, because when I say, how you doing, how's it going? He said, you won't believe it, but most of the time people tell me. I haven't said good morning in 40 years since he told me. Because I want to know, if we go in, if we go into one of our locations, you know, and I say, hey, how you doing? Okay. How you doing? Okay. I said, wait a minute. Okay, what's that? Something wrong? They'll tell you. Oh, you, you care? You, you really want to know? Yeah, I want to know. What's going on? And then you'll be surprised. People will tell you a lot. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you want to know, right? Huh? You know, I always said, how are you doing? And this fellow who called you, the, uh, uh, the dean chairman. You know, many times when you have, we have, 40, 50, 60 employees at any one time, plus you know, all these other people we have, you know, with our outside auditors and you know, lawyers, and we got a lot of people moving around. But this one guy, it's right that I would go in and go, no, I'm not doing too well. You got any money? Say to me, you know, can you spare a few, you know, 500,000? Got a real problem. So I think, okay, come on. So I, I mentioned to Stu Brody once, I said, gee, Stu, you know, some of these guys, they, you know, either they leave you or they forget, you know. And Stu looked at me and said, listen, don't worry about it. He said, you know what that is? I said, what is it? He said, it's your own foreign aid. Don't ever expect to get paid back. <laughs> Which I thought was great. <laughs> so, you know, the customers that, uh, they, they want a fair shake. They want to know that if they're paying for 244 cubic feet or a uh, 180 liter liquid cylinder, that that's what's in there. They don't want, you know, they don't want to feel something that, gee, this feels light. Or, you know, how come I can move this 600 pound liquid nitrogen cylinder around so easily? Yeah, you, you got, I mean, sometimes you can make a mistake, who knows, I mean, sometimes, you know, the product may have leaked out, for whatever reason, then never argue with them, I never argue, say, listen, we'll check it out, put another one in there, we'll check it out, and we'll get back to you and tell you what it was, you know, I mean, maybe you left the valve open over the weekend, I don't know, but I don't want to argue, you know, I think that's the philosophy we've always taken. The customer is king. The customer is right. Now, if I find out that the customer is trying to, you know, do this four or five times in a row, and we have records, I say, well, how come you're the only one that has these leakers? It's amazing. Generally, it solves itself then, if they know you know what you're doing. So, but generally, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, people are good. People are honest. So, that's my other one. It's not about you, you can forget it. You've got to really realize that it's customer focused, it's given them great quality product, puts any competitive price. We've started with the highest quality products. The second in our list is customer service. When do you want it? If you call at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and say, geez, I need something right now, you're going to get it. But you're going to pay because our standard is next day. You call today, you get it tomorrow. Unless it's something you know, very exotic, very rare, and then they know. So that's it. The third for us is expert technical know-how. We got people who know what they're doing. You want a welding machine? We'll run it. You want a refrigerator, freezer, doors? You know, you want these cryogenic equipments? We'll set it up for you. We'll, we'll show you how it works. We'll be there anytime you want if you have a problem. So it doesn't matter to us, but you have to pay for it. If the customer doesn't want to pay for it, we can't deal with us. We can't deal with them. We've got to make money. We're here to make money, entrepreneurs, right? It's the easiest way to get rich. It's also the most difficult to stay rich. Because you've got it all on the table. If you believe in it, you've got it back on the table every day. You know? 
That's what we do. So. I thought this was a discussion. <laughs> you said this was a conversation. It's a one one way conversation. When you want to open it up, you tell me. I'll All right. Open up the question. Yeah, it's ten. It's ten seven. All right. Well, I gotta go. Just see if anybody. Okay. Here's the other main thing. I'm always impressed, but no matter what business you are in, there's a competitor. You know, we're staying in Laguna Beach. Well, I'm within one or two blocks of Laguna Beach. There must be 50 different businesses. I mean, to me, it's unbelievable. I, I don't know what half of them are. But I do know that there's a lot of grocery stores, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of clothing shops. There's a lot of bead places down there. A lot of surf and sports and stuff like that. It's, they're all over. So why should they come in, in my case, why should they come into our business? as opposed to going to someone else. You've got to explain to them what makes you different. You, you've got to say, look, if someone's coming in, they want generally quality. Someone can tell me they want a lower price, but very few things are commodities. Commodity is uh, traded when in Chicago, Chicago exchange. You know, corn, oil, soybeans, <coughs> you name it. But generally, you are doing something which is beyond the product that you're selling. Oxygen is oxygen, nitrogen is nitrogen, helium is helium, argon, you know, you name it. But we we pretty much control the research business in Manhattan for one reason. <coughs> That we have dedicated salespeople, we have dedicated drivers, we have dedicated inside people. They listen to the same people all the time. They talk to the same people. They see the same people. You go in the store, you, you build up a relationship with some people. You may even get to like them. You may get to know them. So, what makes you different? That's what you're going to have to determine as an entrepreneur. What's your edge? If it's just price, you can forget it. You'll be out of business. Short period of time. So, the other thing we learned early on is that if there's a potential big customer, you know, for us that's you know, several hundred thousand dollars, maybe a half a million, whatever. But when we saw that, in the early stages, I was on it. It went president owner to whoever was the president owner of every construction company in Westchester County, in the Bronx, wherever we were going. Because they were like us. They were small business entrepreneurs. You know, they had the mindset we had. I would never push it down. And that's how we are today. We want to deal with the top. And people like Sloan Kettering, you're dealing with the you know, director of purchasing or the director of materials or someone like that. The president is, you know, he's off doing his medical stuff. But you want the, you want the decision makers. And then keep it on that level. Your big customers, you better know them. We can tell you everything about them. They're married, you know, how long have they been married? What's their wife's name? You know, what do they like to do? They want to play golf, they go to dinner. Yeah, we know. And you got to, that's what you have to do. Just stay on it at a very high level. And, you know, every other customer that you see, it, it comes in your store. I and mean, I always say, hey, how you doing? Oh, where do you work? The people generally want to be recognized. They want you to be interested in them. What's their name? I had one guy come into our, our <coughs> operation in Danbury. He was so proud. He's showing me an invoice that dated back 55 years since he was dealing with County Wally. He says, I mean, do you remember when we were down in White in uh, New Rochelle? Of course, I don't remember, but he did. Remember when he was a little kid, his father taking him into White Plains before I owned it. It's unbelievable the loyalty that's been come about. 
All right, so I'll wrap up with just a couple of things. I've stayed more on the selling side, but, you know, the, the capital formation is important. If you want to grow, that's great, but it takes money to grow. And the more you grow, the faster you grow, the more money you're going to have to get, and you've got to get it from someone. You know, we stayed disciplined. We wanted internally generated cash flow because, you know, I had other obligations. So, you know, I get into that mindset, and I think it has stood us well. If someone comes to me now and says, listen, we, got a, uh, you know, we need $200,000, $500,000 for this piece of capital asset, capital equipment, you know, I say, fine, that's great. What's the payback? That's all I want to know. Tell me the payback. If it's anything over three years, I mean, my discipline was three years. If it's anything over three years, it's iffy. You know? I mean, when I was at Union Carbide, they say, oh, we're going to go on a long-range plan, five years. I mean, that was nonsense. My long-range plan is a year. And that, who knows what's happening in a year. Forget that. Stick with your balance sheet, you know, you've got to understand it. How good are your assets? How fast are they turning? You know, you, you people know now that the, you know, the, the, the classic equation, you know, for earning power is your margins and your turn. All right, someone tells me, well, gee, we, we got a lot of inventory. Well, fine, but, uh, you know, how, how, it doesn't mean anything to me. Numbers don't mean anything. How fast is it turning? What's the margin on that particular uh, asset? Receivables. Well, we got all these receivables. Well, I, I, don't, I don't care. The numbers doesn't matter. What's the average day sales outstanding? Right? That's what you need. How good are these assets? You buying a quarter of a million dollars of assets? Well, I wasn't, you know, when I was buying similars, I didn't care. Because I knew it was going to be a three year payback for me. But the similar last 50 years. It's recurring income. It's all these things. It's, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs. That means you have to know everything. You can't be afraid to put it back. If you're hesitant, you say, oh, geez, I got a couple of million on the table. So what? You confident? Then do it. So, you know, that's what I mean. I got to understand the market. I got to understand the asset. It's a powerful asset. Cylinders. Now, and, and so I knew that if I was <coughs> buying cylinders and I was taking care of them and I didn't have them you know, in the yard, I had them out to customers, this was going to be good. You know, Wall Street, as you know, they love the concept of recurring income. It's like <coughs> an annuity. Insurance. If I'm taking care of the customer every day, there's rental income, as long as they keep it. I hope they keep it for 50 years. I'm going to return it. You know, I mean, they have to return it, obviously, you know, to, to get the product re refilled. But I'll, I got another one reserved. We have another one. And we'll take care of that soon. But this is a phenomenal asset. That's why I say you got to know your assets. You know, you don't want to invest in assets that are not going to turn. You don't want to, you don't want to spend $100,000 for something that's engineered for a year, I wouldn't think. Unless your margins are tremendous. Yes, sir? I was just kind of curious if you could talk about maybe your biggest successes and maybe your biggest failure. Okay. Biggest success? Again, when I was first getting into heavy money, and, uh, and I was still paying off all this debt, and it was getting, I don't know, the business downturn or something, and I had a customer, tremendous global company, and I was on it, you know, right? I was the director of materials, and I hadn't yet gone to the treasurer, but I went into this, and 
They announced to me they were going to split the business. It was bigger company. And I said, and I gulped. I said to them, well, give it to him, the other guy. He said, what? I said, give it to him. I don't want it because uh, I don't want my cylinders mixed up with this other guy because he doesn't keep track of his cylinders as well as I do. He so cut he says, the baby in half. Yeah. So he said, he said, are you kidding me? I said, no. I said, is that it? I said, I'm leaving. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, what else you got to do? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. If you give me 100% of the business, I'm going to sign you up for five years on a prepaid rental. It was a couple other cylinders. Liquids, you know, high pressure, low pressure, but primarily liquids. He says, okay, what's the deal? I said, if you, and I needed money. So, first of all, it's 50%. I said, no, it's 100%. He said, the deal is you pay me $92,000 rental up front, and you don't have to pay me rental again for, I think it was three years. Now, I needed that money. And I needed that account. So... <laughs> So he says to me, well, let's go see the treasurer. Uh, I know the guy's name in this day. I went to the treasurer, he said, Jesus, this, this is it's unbelievable. I said, well, that's it. He said, what do I sign? I went out there with $92,000. They paid me right away. So that was big, because I needed it. If I hadn't got it, I don't know where I'd be. Probably wouldn't be around. <laughs> I'm interested in this. Have you ever had any? No. She wants to know his biggest failure. My biggest failure? I, I think it's a combination of things because, you know, in some things you have to be patient. And I, you know, had a you know, tendency that if, if I thought that my message wasn't getting across, you know, I wouldn't hang in. And I'd say, well, you know, my message isn't getting across. And I think that. As a result, I lost a couple of early on real fine accounts. I mean, I know that now they're still around. Because I wasn't patient enough. I didn't let the competitors strangle themselves. You know, it was primarily a, a low ball, you know, low ball, and, you know, we'll give you, you know, 40% less than Dempsey. Well, it was just ridiculous. It was just to get a foothold in. It. So I walked away from a couple of those because I didn't think that they were really up front with me. You know, they, they just wanted me to drop the price. And, and I couldn't make any money. And you know, subsequently, you know, they went through two or three different competitors. You know? But because of how we left, because of how I left them, you know, they were embarrassed to come back to me to say, hey, you were right. So you got to be patient. Give them a little wiggle room. Yeah, you gotta give them a wiggle room. You know, who knows? I, mean, I don't know. They had a bad day. <laughs> you know. I, well, the other thing is, I gotta say one other thing. In entrepreneurial activity, you have to have energy. You have to have good health. You know, and, and I've been blessed with it. You know, because I, I work long hours. I mean, I did, you know, I really work seven days a week for a long time. Maybe on Sundays I'd be in doing paperwork. My wife was the greatest reconciler of cylinder discrepancies that this industry's ever had. <laughs> I mean, she'd take them home, it was almost like a puzzle. I go, oh my God, you can't be doing this, please. Let's just sell it. No, no, we gotta do it. She was tremendous. And is today, still, she, you're, you're the greatest cylinder person. I don't have to do it anymore, thanks to the barcoding. No, you don't have to do it, but you still would like to. I trust you over the barcode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me make a couple of last comments, please, before we give him a heck of a hand. As a guy who's been married over 40 years, I would tell you, sir, I want to correct you. Yes. Your biggest, biggest success in life is sitting right here. Oh, of course. <laughs> That's a, a wow. How many years? 48? 45. This 45 year. years, okay? So you made a mistake by not <laughs> Listen, I you guys. I did. <laughs> pay attention to what you said here today. A classy man 
who's made it, but he also understands how to make it. You guys, I want, I want this to stick in your heads. I want you to have dreams. Wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, where am I going to be? Am I going to be what he's doing? Am I going to be this? Am I going to be that? That's how you succeed. You start thinking right now, where am I going? What am I going to be? How am I going to do it? How am I going to be up here and receive from old Kiesner 25 years from now? I'll be a little more bent over, but I'll be happy to give you one of these awards. You keep that in the back of all your minds because every single person in this class has the potential to be incredibly successful. So give them a monstrous hand. Uh, Courtney, I need to see you. Yes. And I need to see you.